My name is Mark Stern. I'm a professor in the School of Social Policy and Practice and co-director of the Urban Studies Program. And this is a panel on arts and urban transformation. Uh, you know, I've got to admit I was kind of worried this week. Um, this is my 32nd commencement week since I came to Penn, you know, because I started here when I was seven. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I had a certain image of commencement week, which is, you know, all these people out on the AstroTurf in Franklin Field, 80 degrees, 80% 80 humidity, you know, those uh, academic robes serving the same purpose that aluminum foil does when you roast a turkey, you know. And, but all week I've been, I've had the heat on at home, I've uh, been wearing turtlenecks, but, you know, like I was so cheered today when I was walking over from 30th Street that, all right, today it feels more like commencement week. So it's good to have this going and to have the alumni here today. I think we've got a really uh, interesting panel today. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a brief introduction of the speakers. Uh, I hope you all got uh, the, the flyer that came and it has a more extensive uh, 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 introduction for them. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, what I was going to do was talk uh, briefly about some of the work we've done and then uh, each of the, I've asked each of the panel members to take 10 or 15 minutes to really talk about their program. Because, you know, we, uh, my research project has been studying community arts programs now for 15 years. And one of the things we've come to realize is people really don't understand how these programs work and what they do in community. So I've really encouraged the speakers to take some time to lay out what they've done and what their, how their vision has connected to the, the kinds of programs they've run. Uh, so, uh, in addition to me, the two speakers today are Jenny Peek, uh, uh, who is founder and executive uh, artistic director at the Manton Avenue Project in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and not coincidentally, she's uh, celebrating her 25th. Fifth. I reunion. also coincidentally also started when I was seven. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Just like we really have a, a panel of prodigies. <laughs> Uh, and then our second speaker uh, will be Jane Golden, who's executive director of uh, the Mural Arts Program here in the city of Philadelphia, and who is uh, really has a national reputation in, in the mural movement, and certainly is one of the, the important uh, uh, practitioners in terms of public art in, in, in the city today. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk briefly. Of, as I mentioned, uh, for the last 15 years, I've run a research project here at Penn uh, called the Social Impact of the Arts Project that has essentially tried to use uh, a multiplicity of methods to get a handle on how the arts impact urban neighborhoods and, and their, their residents. Uh, we started the project really because at the time, the, almost all of the focus uh, of research on Art, the impact of the arts focused on its straightforward economic development impact. Uh, that uh, you built a big mega uh, project downtown and people came in and people came from New York to see it. Uh, and while that certainly is an important aspect of, of arts and culture in the city, uh, we felt that it was missing a lot of what goes on in the city's neighborhoods uh, in terms of how the arts mobilize individuals uh, families and communities around uh, the value of their neighborhood and the value of art within those neighborhoods. So we've essentially spent the last 15 years trying to develop a set of methods uh, to kind of figure out what those dynamics are and how uh, the concentration of arts assets in particular neighborhood has impacts in terms of the overall well-being of those neighborhoods. Now as I mentioned, we use a, multi a whole range of methods in terms of doing that. Uh, looking both at kind of a, a bird's eye view in terms of looking at the entire city and how culture, uh, uh, kind of how cultural assets are arrayed across the entire city, but also going into particular neighborhoods and looking at what happens there. But since we have practitioners with us today, what I'm going to do is focus primarily on some of our bird's eye uh, uh, Findings. In terms of our region-wide view, what we've tried to do is use geographic information systems uh, to look at the how of what we refer to as these cultural assets 
concentrate in particular neighborhoods. So in this example, what we've done is we've developed regional-wide uh, inventories of these four, four elements, nonprofit arts organizations, uh, like the groups that our, our uh, panelists run, uh, that is official 501c3s, commercial cultural firms. So these are, are for-profit entities that are involved in the culture business. And that can range from kind of a highbrow design firm in Center City to, you know, Madam Fifi's School of Dance uh, in some neighborhood. And in fact, you know, we, we had this realization there are actually more for-profit dance schools in the city of Philadelphia than there are nonprofits who focus on, on dance. You know, so, you know, so like ignoring that for-profit se uh, sector can actually get you in trouble in terms of understanding what's going on. Uh, the third element is what we refer to as cultural participants. Uh, we, 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 did, we developed this database by essentially going out to organizations and saying, who comes to your events? Who are your subscribers? Who are, the mem who are your members? And then we've taken those lists. I think in 2004, I think we had 600,000 individual records. And then we used geographic information systems to figure out where those people live and then how many of them are in each area of the city. And then the final element is, was resident artists. Uh, where do the artists live in Philadelphia? What neighborhoods are they concentrated in? And what, in this case, what I'm showing here is essentially we developed an index that looks at all four of those uh, indexes simultaneously and identifies where in the city you have this particular concentration in terms of, of, of all these different kinds of cultural assets. And as you can see, uh, there are kind of three or four major concentrations. Center City, really more uh, greater Center City, because Center City is just here, but you go up towards the Art Museum, you go up towards Northern Liberties, you go well into South Philadelphia, but the sort of greater Center City. Uh, uh, you've got the Northwest, uh, uh, Mount Airy, Chestnut Hill, and Germantown. Uh, a big concentration in terms of uh, uh, lower Montgomery County, uh, in terms of Bell Kinwood and coming up through the main line. And then an, another concentration down, I guess that's probably Swarthmore uh, and, and that area. So you end up with a, a map of where in the metropolitan area you have these concentrations of cultural, what we call cultural assets. Um, what we do next then, in terms of our project around this issue of impacts, is we try to link this concentration of cultural assets to certain kinds of outcomes. And I've just very briefly listed some of these here. Uh, uh, we go, again, using ge geographic information systems, we're able to go out and get a database of where uh, uh, there were incidents of, say, ethnic and, and racial harassment uh, during the year. And then look at how those statistical relationships play out over time. Uh, you know, so the, one of the ones we've used recently is a social stress index that was actually developed uh, from a Penn project centered uh, in the school social policy in the ed school that looked at a set of uh, outcomes around children and, and families in the neighborhoods. Uh, okay. You know, so uh, actually, this is one of the tricks of using these kind of data. Not everyone wants to let you see all of their data. So we actually, we ended up with this index that put together a whole set of factors under uh, weight uh, infants, uh, uh, teen pregnancies, infant deaths, uh, these various factors. And then we're able to look at the correlation between that and where cultural assets are. And you see, you end up with a fairly uh, a strong relationship where neighborhoods with the highest levels of cultural assets have much lower scores on this social stress index than areas. And that's controlling for income. It's not simply that rich neighborhoods have more cultural assets. In this case, we're, we're, we control for that statistically. And if you do that, you still find this relatively robust relationship. Uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were really interested in this issue of uh, ethnic and racial harassment. You know, Philadelphia has a history around this stuff. Uh, uh, and clearly, if you're talking about the quality of life in neighborhoods and the quality of life for all the residents in a neighborhood, uh, making sure that uh, our identifying neighborhoods with low levels of harassment clearly is an important index of that. Uh, what we found interesting was that neighborhoods that, not surprisingly, neighborhoods that are undergoing ethnic uh, transformation are much more likely to have these incidents than neighborhoods that uh, 
uh, are more homogeneous or more stable in terms of their ethnic composition. But what we found was among those neighborhoods that are, are ethnically diverse, the ones with large numbers of cultural assets had much lower rates of harassment than those with higher rates. So again, it's a very strong relationship controlling for other factors between uh, where, arts, where arts activities are concentrated and where you have these outcomes in terms of uh, ethnic and racial harassment. Uh, similarly, we, we looked at the relationship of serious crime. This again comes from, uh, we were able to get this data uh, through the cartographic modeling lab uh, here at Penn, uh, which is based in the School of Social Policy and Practice. And once again, again, you've got cultural assets going and then rates of serious crime. And you can see, again, you see a fairly strong relationship between the two. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, we've also looked at some of the economic consequences of kind of improvements in quality life. So in this case, what we were looking at, uh, um, another uh, nonprofit in town, uh, the Reinvestment Fund, uh, has done extensive work on changes in, in neighborhoods, housing uh, markets over time. Uh, and this, this was fun because like, this wasn't our data. We got their data and our data, and we put them together to see what we found. And honestly, this slide makes me queasy because like, if I was going to fabricate a relationship between these two factors, I wouldn't make it as strong as this slide seems because it looks suspicious. But in fact, these were, I, I, honestly, these were the real data that uh, neighborhoods that, these neighborhoods that are kind of in this ugly green are ones that improved in terms of their housing markets by two categories over a three year period. Or, is to your cultural right, and the dark areas are areas that had high high concentrations of cultural assets. So you can see that, except for a couple of areas up in the northeast, virtually all the neighborhoods that improved during this period in terms of their housing markets were in these neighborhoods that we we, as shorthand, we talk about them as natural cultural districts, places where you get this concentration without, like, the city deciding that that's going to be a, a cultural neighborhood. Uh, so that's very briefly, as I said, this gives kind of an overview of that, you know, we're definite, we're certainly finding these very strong relationships between areas of the city where you have this kind of concentration of arts and culture and these positive outcomes in terms of <coughs> neighborhood stability, neighborhood well-being, and, and the economic status of, of neighborhoods. Uh, so. At this point, I was going to turn it over, I think, first to Jenny to uh, talk about her program in Providence and then move from there. So, so the Mountain Avenue Project is, is uh, an organization. We just celebrated our sixth anniversary in January. Uh, we're in Providence, Rhode Island. We are a replication of a project in New York called the 52nd Street Project. And I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but what, like them, we take children living in an uh, economically challenged neighborhood and expose them to the arts, theater specifically, and we teach the children how to write plays starting at the age of eight. Uh, the shows that we ultimately produce are written by the children, acted and directed by the adults primarily. So the eight-year-olds are the playwrights and adult professional actors are the actors and directors and so they have to listen to what the kids want which is really um, pretty wonderful. But what we do is we use theater to help these kids that a lot of people by virtue of where the children are growing up don't give a lot, have a high expectations for it, and we say anything you want to do. If you can write a play, you can, if you want to write a play, you can write a play. If you want to go to college, you can go to college. Whatever you want to do. It's really, really simple. I mean, all we're really doing is, uh, you know, our feeling is every child is born with the same potential. Opportunity is what makes the difference. And so if you just say to kids, I'm going to give you an opportunity to believe in yourself. I'm going to give you an opportunity to let your voice be heard. I'm going to give you an opportunity to understand how powerful you are then they take it from there. So we're not giving the kids anything, we're just kind of helping them find it within themselves. So well, I'm just gonna go through my slides quickly and then talk a little bit more about the program, but um, the top right one, wait, your left, my right, <laughs> stage right, um, is just at one of our curtain calls. And just to sort of show you, the kids are in the front and then all of the adults that helped worked with, work with them are behind them. And that's something we started to do at the final curtain call. Kids would all take, I mean, the children all would take a bow before their, when their play was done, 
bring all the kids up at the end. And then I thought, let's bring all the adults up too to sort of remind everybody about the 18 or 21 people or 24 people that volunteered. All of them are volunteers. They volunteered their time to work with the kids. Um, we have a big fundraising event. And because our philosophy is everyone is a playwright, because the, here the real, I'm looking at a, bunch, a room full of playwrights. And most of you, of course, won't believe me because you're adults. Um, but you are. If you have a story to tell, you have a play to write. So we invite guest celebrities from Providence to write a play for us. And so this was um, Karen Adams, who is lead news anchor for the, the number one news um, station in Providence, Rhode Island, wrote a play for, um, and she's watching part of it come to life. Dahlia is 10 years old, and then the man with her is the artistic director of Trinity Repertory Company, which is the major rep company uh, in Providence. So. Um, She's having a great time just watching him. So um, the next slide is uh, Leilani is in. We, we do have a show in which the kids co-write and co-star in a, in a play. So that's Leilani is 10 years old, and she's playing a female uh, chihuahua uh, wiener dog named Phil. Um, <laughs> These are our playwrights waiting for their work being done. And then this is the money shot. This is, we have a playwright's desk at every show. And so the playwright watch sits and wa is, is in the light and watches their show come to life. And so when you're an audience member, you not only see the genius, but you see, you don't, you not only see the genius, but you see the genius. And so this is Sonia, is uh, nine years old. And this was um, Sonia watching her first play. So that is how you transfer, you know, that's how easy it is. Because Sonia now believes that she can do any. Her invincibility is pretty apparent to her because she's watching it happen um, and listening to the people around her. Um, and then the next slide is we, every summer, we bring the uh, group of our kids away. Beautiful place. Last year we went to a gorgeous place in northwestern New Hampshire. And um, we have one adult, one child writing the play together that based on the, uh, the concept of the child. And this is Katie and Jalisa. Jalisa has been with our program for five years. She has uh, probably one of the more challenging stories of, of a lot of the kids that um, we've been working with, but maintains this incredible exuberance and um, optimism for life. And Katie's just decided to give Jalisa her camera and said, you know, Jalisa, why don't you take some pictures? Jalisa had never had a camera before. And so the next slide, um, is two of Jaleesa's pictures <laughs> that she just took and didn't know anything about exposure, didn't know anything about, but she just saw this. And so, you know, that's, so, we, so what happened is we were able to show Jaleesa something that she didn't even know she could do. And now she's, we're going to get her some classes. She wants to, she's thinking about pursuing photography as a career uh, and all of those things. And, and to watch Jaleesa realize that she had found her, gene, her, her thing that she was astounding at. And it was through the theater. So, um, so those are just our pictures. But I feel like, is this echoing? Um, what can I do? I feel like I'm. I'm thinking maybe they're feeding back on each other. All right. Okay. Um, but what we do is really pretty simple and straightforward. And I think that that's really the point of of the way that art can transform people's lives and transform children and transform neighborhoods, is. Our mission statement is to increase the self-esteem and unleash the creative voices of inner city children by uniting them with professional artists to create original theater. And that's what we do. That's all we do. Every day, everything that we do is about that. And so that, I think, is one of the keys when you're, when you're going to do something. Have a really simple mission and try to do something that carries that mission out every day. And that's what really what we try to do. I mean, I think it's one of my favorite, um, it takes a village to raise a child. I, and it takes a child to empower a village. And so if you, you, can st you start with one child and you give them the sense of what they can do, and creativity does that, art does that, whether it's visual art, whether it's performing arts. But art is something that all of us, we find, it, it can help us find the power that we have inside of ourselves. And we all have that ability. And so if you give the ability to that child, it, it leaks over into their family and into their community and into their neighbors. And, and so it's really simple. We, the philosophy is really simple. Um, and it sort of makes me think, well, I mean, it's not, and it's certainly a lot of work, but it's really not that much work. And it's really so easy. The very, very easiest thing I've, I've, I've learned is to help a child understand 
the incredible power that he or she has. And to know that anything that they want to do is in the, within their grasp if they're willing to work for it. So I think that what happens is we open the eyes of the kids to what they can do. We open the eyes of the neighborhood. You know, and, and you know, the neighborhood becomes incredibly proud of the kids. The community is very, very proud. The neighborhood we happen to work in is the, it has the lowest income in the city of Providence. 64% of the families are living below the poverty level. Um, but it's very uh, culturally rich in that it's a lot of, it's, pre it's predominantly Guatemalan, Guatemalan Mexican, and um, uh, Dominican. And so, What's really interesting and something that I've learned, I mean, I've learned a lot w with my working with the organization, but it is, because it is a high, densely immigrant neighborhood, the sense of community and culture is really, really strong there, as opposed to other neighborhoods where that has started to go away. The children are either first generation Americans or they are from another country themselves. And so they're really in touch with their culture. They're really in touch with the, from the, with the places that they come from. And that's something that, a lot of people have forgotten about. A lot of people have lost touch with that. So I just, they've reminded me um, and they've helped me and I think a lot of the adults that um, to really sort of understand the power of that and the power of the community. And the other thing that I think we've really done is, is shown other people in the city and in Rhode Island and in, in, in southeastern Massachusetts um, how powerful the neighborhood is. I mean, I think it's really interesting to take a neighborhood that a lot of people go, oh, you know, that's whatever, that had made a sort of a, a snap judgment about and show them that, wait a second, there's this incredible, incredible, it's this place where amazing things are coming out of there. Look at these amazing kids that are coming from this neighborhood that are who they are because of the neighborhood they live in. They are who they are because of the community that they are part of. And it's showing everybody else just how incredible and powerful um, and how much they deserve to be respected, and their families deserve to be respected, and the community, how important that community is to the city of Providence um, and, and to Rhode Island. And so, you know, we, we do all of those things. And, and the most important thing is we have a lot of fun when we're doing it. I mean, we're, we do serious things in a not so serious way. I mean, if we have a dog about, uh, and we have a play about a, a wiener dog named Phil, uh, then, you know, how really seriously can we take ourselves? I mean, our foams are, our props are made out of foam core, and you know, we have all sorts of animals. We, we did a play that was about a gangster pig, a robot, and um, a mechanic that was really a superhero. And, you know, I mean, that's fun. And that's the other great thing, too, is it, and I think that's art allows the fun to happen. Art puts fun into everybody's life. And, um, you know, I just think that it's, it's such a great, it's a great way to open the door you know, and that's really all that we're doing is we're just kind of saying, yes, you can do this. And what else can you do? do you know, dig. It's, it's a very emotional, it's very visceral, but, you know, just do it. I mean, all of you are, all of you are playwrights. And if you were eight years old, you would believe me very easily. Um, and so I think that the other thing, too, is that we do is the kids change the lives of all the adults that they work with and make them remind, remind them about the magic of it and the power of it and how transformative um, it can be. So we'll get into more of what I do, but that's kind of an intro. Uh, how do the kids find their way into your program? They find their way in through either teacher recommendation, mm -hmm. a lot of them, or a lot of them are younger brothers or sisters, or cousins, or neighbors, or best friends of the kids, and they'll come up to me at the show and say, Miss Jenny, I want to do it too. And as soon as they're in third grade in their ears, I mean, I just, we have probably uh, a, one, two, three, four sets of siblings so far. Um, one just entered one, and there's a younger brother, a five-year-old in his first grade who's waiting, has been coming to the sh his brother's show since he was a little tiny baby, and he's um, waiting to be old enough. And, um, and so the kids are really great recruiters. I mean, the kids themselves are just like, oh, Miss Jenny, they'll bring, they'll drag one of their friends over and say, Miss Jenny, this, um, here's somebody else who wants to do playmaking. So, you know, I mean, it, it, the kid, and we, we have programs, we keep the kids, once they're involved, we keep them involved. We have five different pieces of programming. The idea is to keep them involved ultimately through high school. We're gonna start a team program once we can, but right now what happens is the older kids come back into the classroom 
and help the younger kids with playmaking. So we do start, we start with the seven weeks of playmaking class. Then they have a, a, a weekend in which they meet their creative team, which is generally one director and two actors. Every child has three people that are dedicated to them and all about them. And then they interview the actors so that they can write a part, part specifically for them. And they base their plays on a central theme. Um, and then we perform it for a weekend um, in a theater space. But yeah, they come. And teachers, what's really interesting is I have one really amazing teacher at this elementary, uh, astounding elementary school in the neighborhood, astounding, um, who gets what we do and will give me a list of kids. And most of them are not writers. Most of them are just right for the program because she knows that they need it. Um, and, and what's really interesting is it, it, it pretty quickly helps the children. I mean, she was telling me that one little boy who never participated in class and never raised his hand, wrote his first play, sat at the desk, took his first bow, and now she can't shut him up. I mean, he just really <laughs> wants to participate all the time. So it's great, you know, to sort of get that really immediate thing. Because again, all we did is we said to him, you're valuable. What you have to say, we want to listen to. And we do say that in the classroom, too. And I, I think that that's one of the reasons that we've been able to get kids and want to stay. We always say, if it's your idea, then it's something we want to listen to. There's not right and wrong. There's not black and white. There's not A, B, and C. As long as it's not disrespectful, your ideas are, are, are something that, are re that we don't, won't laugh at you. We'll embrace it. And they don't necessarily hear that in school a lot. I think particularly standardized testing has made it even more challenging for kids. But, um, but we sort of say, if, it's, if it comes from you, then it's right. So. Great. OK, so um, the mural arts program, and Jenny, that was wonderful. Um, I want you to come to Philly and work with us. <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, we're a, a public art program, a community public art program, uh, you know, dedicated to providing art to every citizen of the city. And we're on a mission to make sure as many young people as possible have access to art education. The program is about providing services to individuals, to communities, and by extension, there's an impact on the civic life of the city. There are over 3,000 indoor and outdoor murals in Philadelphia today. And it's not so much that number that's important, although I do think it's wonderful that there's art everywhere. It's the fact that each mural is the result of a very detailed, complicated community process that involves many, many stakeholders. I want you to think about public art. Philadelphia is filled with wonderful public art, lots of sculptures, there are monuments, but what, what, what our program does in a way, it says shift the paradigm and look at art created not necessarily by a lone practitioner, but art that has been made by a lot of people. And mural arts really comes out of another program where I got my start in Philadelphia, and that's the Anti-Graffiti Network. Philadelphia in the mid 80s, there was a new mayor, Wilson Good, first African American mayor, and there was also a graffiti crisis. There was graffiti everywhere. Um, I had graduated from Stanford, moved to LA, did murals there, worked with kids on probation, came um, back east, and eventually was hired by Anti Graffiti to run a little art program. Uh, Wilson Good uh, set up Anti Graffiti. He had 10 community organizers, and there was me, there was an amnesty pledge where kids, they look happy, don't they? They, swore, they took a pledge where they swore they'd never write on walls for the rest of their life. We knew this wasn't true, but it was a way in the door. Once they did scrub time, they were sent to me, and I was supposed to do something about it. Um, Tim Spencer gave me a box in 1985, and it was filled with magic markers and paper, and he said, good luck. <laughs> You're going to have about 1,000 kids. And then he walked me down the hall to the art room, <laughs> which was a closet. And, uh, and there were graffiti writers everywhere, and you knew they were graffiti writers because they had backpacks that make clicking sounds and then they would go in the hall, they dart in the hall and you hear it Sss. and I go are they writing in City Hall Annex and it was like yes and then there were police officers in and out so when you think about the origins of my job think about a police drama you've seen on TV NYPD blue law and order perhaps and that is exactly what anti graffiti was like I felt sort of overwhelmed because I was always an artist who wanted to go to law school so I thought maybe I should have gone to law school but I also felt like I was living on the edge right it was like this is exciting but more importantly Wilson Good had a vision for Philly. He wanted to clean up neighborhoods and he was going to work with kids who were writing on walls. Pretty simple concept, right? But it wasn't being done like that anywhere. And what he did is he put money on the table, millions of dollars. Most of those dollars went for kids. So we had a pretty large carrot. 
But more importantly, I think the seat of power was open to kids from the poorest neighborhoods of the city. So talk about a paradigm shift. That's exactly what was happening in Philly in the mid 80s. And so what happened is I started meeting graffiti writers and trying to infiltrate the graffiti world, which I found out was highly organized. They'd meet in North Philly, they'd plan their routes, they had leaders, they had followers. This was so organized, I thought maybe they had like a consultant. You know what I mean? I was like shocked. I was like, what's going on here? Um, they also, when I drove around in my undercover police car the city gave me, which was totally dented when you beep the horn, the trunk flew open, um, <laughs> I noticed that people, these kids had talent. And so, um, I, so I started to set up programs, uh, the art museum, churches, community centers. I started these programs. And then I was given an assistant, a young man who wrote, wrote Tran everywhere. And Tran was um, a notorious graffiti writer. Not exactly the assistant I wanted, but you know, I'm sort of, I can go, I'm flexible. So I went with it. And Tran introduced me to the big name graffiti writers, Cool Earl, Disco Duck, Baby Rock, Cat, M.A. Well, he brought them to my house. They were not invited. And then and they, I realized there in my living room, they started pulling out all the books on abstract expressionism, that they loved art. They had an uncanny knowledge of Mark Rothko, William de Kooning, Hans Hoffman. And when I asked them how they knew about these people, they pulled out the magazine um, Art in America and told me they'd been stealing it since they were 10. Interesting magazine to steal. So anyway, so, to get, so I told these guys about anti-graffiti, tried to lure them into signing this pledge, got them to sign up, and we started the mural program. How did we start a mural program? We drove around neighborhoods and asked people if they wanted art on their wall. And you know what people said to us in the, in the late 80s? No, we don't. Art can't help us. Our neighborhood's been neglected for 20, 30 years. And finally, we were able to go back so many times, because I'm tenacious, the kids were tenacious, that we got people to invite us into their homes, their churches, their kitchens, their living rooms, and we started talking to people about what they wanted. People said, nothing is, nothing is done with us. Things are done to us or not done. And the only visual stimulation we have in this neighborhood are billboards advertising alcohol and tobacco. Our kids will not have beauty. And see, that's what's so great about murals. That's, you know, I know I'm biased, but murals make art accessible to everyone. I love galleries and museums. Art does not belong behind those walls exclusively. So we could say to Ms. Bagby, Ms. Clark, Ms. Bullock, these community leaders, this can change. What do you want on this wall? And people said, we want stories of our heroes, our children. We want stories of our past, our present, our struggles, our aspirations. So for years we did murals. We worked with kids who were graffiti writers. And then in 1997, uh, anti-graffiti was closed down. I went to our then mayor, uh, then mayor, now governor, Ed Rendell, asked if he'd save the little art program. He said he would. He said, come up with a name for yourselves. We said, the mural arts program. He said, Jane Golden, you're in charge. I was like, great. Only it was like not in charge of much because we had a teeny little budget. But then we decided we're a pro art program. We're going to open our doors to all kids. Um, you know, like, because uh, too many kids in Philly attend schools where art is not an option. We designed several different curriculums around mural painting that included citizenship, civic engagement, design, and color. And it was just amazing, like you see, Jenny, like kids came alive. More importantly, neighborhoods came alive. This wall, this is 1998 in a neighborhood where all communication between blacks and whites had shut down. Grace Ferry. People said, we decided we were going to do a peace wall. One of our first projects is the mural arts program. People said, forget it. You're naive. It's never going to happen. And after a year of going door to door and asking people to show the world that change was possible, people said, OK, we want a mural of hands. These are real people's hands. We took the picture. The fact that they reached towards each other was significant because here there was nothing but conflict. We did this mural. We digitized the image. We projected it on the wall at night. The dedication was one of the most integrated events down there. And then since then, what's our responsibility? Not just to go into a neighborhood and do a project, because that would be random and ad hoc, but to stay as long as we can, do more work, start edu art education programs, and try to bring about change. Change can be subtle. It can be just color in a neighborhood that is gray. Or it can be huge where a lot that is filled with trash, syringes, just neglect gets turned into something beautiful. So we started to see the catalytic power of art. I'm not saying it's a cure-all for everything that is wrong with the city. I am telling you that murals show us the catalytic role that art can play in the life of the city and how it empowers people and changes people from being on the sidelines, feeling disempowered and disconnected, to being activists and feeling that they can truly be agents of change. And then we started doing gateway projects. When you look at the 3,000 murals in the city, what I want 
want you to think of is that the work is really the autobiography of the city. It is not the mural arts program operating alone. It is, we are one part of a very large, beautiful quilt that includes residents, neighborhoods, businesses, and most of most importance, young people who help create this work. This was kids in the, in, the, in the Chinatown. We worked with the Asian Arts Initiative, a fabulous program. We worked with poets. And it's a gateway project because it's a significant location at 12th and Vine. And then we started doing bigger transformations. My second job is I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. And so we try to get the students to have a developed sort of consciousness about social change, not just read theories of change, but get out there and take a neighborhood and change it. Partner with our young people, partner with community groups. So a site like this gets turned into this. That's Miss Jones, she's the matriarch of the neighborhood, but people felt this space will never change, but that's not true, because working together, we can flip things, we can change things, and it's, see, it's our responsibility. Every time we have a little victory, we need to strategically build on that, and the work becomes a sign that things can change, that people care, and that in some way, government can be effective. We are a hybrid organization, public and private, 40% of our budget comes from the city, the rest we raise privately, but we are a city agency. That means when we go into a community, we have a responsibility to call LNI, call the streets department, make sure that other changes happen. We have a resource guide to demystify city government, because why shouldn't people in poor neighborhoods get services? Absolutely they should. And a wall like this gets turned into this. Those kids are all star students. And what the kids do is they start learning very, very strategically how to create public art. And then rec centers get turned into works of art. That this rec center, the playground was a field of glass and the equipment was falling apart. So what we do in analysis initially and say, what kind of changes do you want? Every mural, every mural is the result of a very complicated community process. It can be three meetings, it can be dozens of meetings to make sure the art is owned and owned by that community. And because of that, people say, well, out of those murals, how many are defaced? Out of 3,000, maybe six or seven. Not many because of the way, I think there is a community methodology that we consistently try to enforce. Here's the rec center. Here are the neighbors. And that's, um, that's Richard and Norman. And they, um, they're a part of this great group of people who helped change this neighborhood. It's also about, in a way, capacity building because we want to make sure that somehow what we've done in that neighborhood has changed people so that when we leave, the spirit of mural arts goes on. And then a project like this is a, this is a mosque gets turned into this. That's gold leaf paint, mosaic, and ceramic. There were tensions between the neighborhood and the mosque. And through the process of creating this, we worked with the Arts and Spirituality Center. The tensions went away. And a wall like this gets turned into this. N currently, we're serving 2,000 young people every year in after school programs that go year round. Uh, this one was about a search for identity. These are kids who are coming out of residential placement who created this. They'd never worked with a paintbrush, never had exposure to art, yet were able to create this. We say keep kids in your program for long periods of, st of time. The work should be sequential and it should be sustained and rigorous. So here they work with printmakers and writers, poets, musicians. They interviewed people in the neighborhood and a, this mural goes around an entire city block. This, schools in the city look like prisons. We say change schools, turn a prison into a paradise. That's what the principal of the McKinley School said. Please do that for us. And here we did interactive learning gardens. We have a restored spaces program now where we pair up a landscape architect, an architect, a painter, and a sculptor. We tie in, we tap into different disciplines now. Every year we're employing about 350 artists and teaching artists, contributing about $2.2 million to the creative economy in Philadelphia. As a fan of the WPA, that gives me great delight to see government supporting the arts. <laughs> Yay. And here we have a school, a school, a school, and there, so our kids said, we said, take, tear down that barbed wire fence and we're gonna make something at University of the Arts. Our kids created this fence and did welding. And so we try to build in as many complicated skills as we can in the process. And this is an interactive learning garden. And then we have, again, the school is in North Philadelphia. And this restored spaces program, we train the teachers. We've designed a curriculum about art and ecology to try to create an affinity with kids to the natural world. This is a ceramic tree made in part at Tyler School of Art. We also say put opportunities in young people's sight lines just like Jenny is doing by opening up their world through writing. We're doing that through the visual arts. 
We're also doing a lot of work along major corridors. We recently have data that indicates that murals by the mural arts program done along corridors that could tip either way increase retail sales and property values, which is fantastic. This is Lancaster Avenue around 39th Street. This mural is part mosaic, part paint. And then we did a cluster of other work. We took down this barbed wire fence, went away. This new fence went up. You can see the stained glass. There's plantings now. There's a new flower shop across the street. When we, we have mural tours. Um, about 15,000 visitors went on tours last year. Gene is here, he's one of our great docents. Um, we uh, actually, we, we, I stop, if I'm on the tour, I stop there because I just can't believe the transformation. This is, these are pots across the street. There's the flat, you see the flowers. And then we do projects too about the history of a neighborhood. This is about urban cowboys, a tradition that is going away. By doing public art in communities, you can hold on to the past, hold on to history as neighborhoods change and evolve and develop. What is wonderful about this city, as Mark alluded to, is that we have amazing cultural and community organizations in the city of Philadelphia. And what we want to do is work with people to lift everything up. It is a collaborative effort at the end of the day. And here is a, a nursing home, a nursing home where the kids and the seniors said, we want our stories on this wall. So the wallpaper you see is actually the text from the seniors. The flowers are mosaic, and that shadow is all painted on. It's trompe l'oeil, <laughs> which was great. Then there are murals inside the nursing home, and now we have a program there as well. And this is the heart of Baltimore Avenue. 80 figures, two walls face each other. When you tune into a low-frequency low radio station, you hear the voices of the community. It's Prometheus Radio, another great program. And what was great is that two groups requested this mural, a group of anarchists and the University City District, two groups that did not like each other. But yet, through this process, everyone came to the conclusion, we want the voice of the community. And we were like, that's fantastic. You're all talking the same language. Let's get going. And so we did this project. We did a dozen murals and mosaics all about passage and journey. Our kids studied with engineers, and they learned about the issue of sustainability. And here, if you follow the, the murals, it's, it takes people actually eventually to the river. So it's very subtle, it's very abstract. And recently we did a project called Love Letters with Stephen Powers, who was a graffiti writer in the mid 80s, who, who did, wrote everywhere. He eventually moved to New York, became a famous artist, had this idea to work with mural arts and do a project called Love Letters. He did 50 second story walls about love that you can only see from the L train going through West Philadelphia. There's a flip book, a coffee table book, but I want to tell you the most exciting thing is eventually we opened up a sign shop in West Philadelphia to do what we thought would be artistic, glib sort of signs except it became a workforce development pro program. We were able to hire a lot of West Philly artists, more than we thought, and then the Commerce Department came to us and commissioned real signs. We started training people in sign making. One of our former graffiti writers is a sign maker, and suddenly, before you knew it, this place was a hub, so we were thrilled. And here's some of the examples of the work. <laughs> I love this, it's so great. Here we go. And uh, you know what, when you have community meetings about love, guess what, the first half hour people talk about what they hate about Philly. Once they get that out of their system, they were ready to talk about love. And then we work in the prisons, we're in, every, we're in the Philadelphia prisons, we're in Greaterford Prison too. And we also do projects, this is about addiction and recovery here, we just have it on the ground. It's made out of parachute cloth. 1,200 people worked on this who were going through, um, it's a methadone program in North Philadelphia. Here's a green wall that we're doing in West Philadelphia. Now we're using, we're, we're doing sculpture, ceramic, mosaic, light, sound, the sky's the limit. And our kids just, they created an irrigation ditch and they had to do all this complicated stuff. I couldn't even explain to you how it's happening. So but June 10th, yes, you've seen it. Have you've seen it. You've seen, oh, have you seen that? Well, no. Go by now. You'll see, well, it doesn't look like much except two towers, but it was very hard to get to this point. And then we're doing a new project at Broadenvine about the, about the contemporary face of nursing. It has an LED component. A hundred nurses have been interviewed and will be on this wall. And it's about how wonderful community nursing is and the future of healthcare in this country. And then we have a great pro project where we're, we've given looms to shelters all over the city and people are weaving stories of their lives. We have public weaving events and the, the mural will be at 13th and Market will be part fabric, part metal, part paint. And there is the design, and it will be fabricated within a month. And this is the airport, 55,000 square feet. It's about the dancer and all of us. This is also about workforce development. We are going to have people in our reentry program working on this. 
it's a deceptively complex program in a way. You look at the art around the city and you think it's really beautiful, but what I want you to think about is all the people who participate, the community that helps create the vision. And there's a saying that, uh, that I love, it's hope is believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. The privilege, the true privilege of this work is that we have been able to see concrete, tangible changes take place in communities, in neighborhoods, all over the city of Philadelphia. There's a waiting list of 2,000 people who want murals. Now cities all over the world are calling us. It's like a renaissance going on here. And the changes we see in individuals, people in prison, and kids is profound, inspiring, and it's really a gift to do this job. Thank you. So you know, it's interesting. Um, when we, when I uh, first started doing our research on it, uh, I went to give a paper on community arts in Philadelphia, and we got a very distinguished sociologist from our sociology department here to be my commentator. And she looked at me and said, "This community arts is that like grandmothers with crayons in the living room?" You know. And what I realized, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted you each to have plenty of time to talk about your program is I do think. Um, there's a tendency to pigeonhole community arts programs as essentially just social service, that it's mm -hmm. a, and that it's not real art. Uh, and I guess one of the questions I'd ask is, you know, as you're as you're doing your programs, um, is there a tension between kind of pushing the artistic side of it and you know the social and kind of your your social objectives? Is there a way that those two sometimes come into uh, there's a tension between those? Could you like give examples of that or? Sure. I mean, I, you know, we've gotten you know bruised during the years. Um, in the beginning, people said, you know, your work it's it's interesting, but it's sort of like social work. It's not real art. And I'm like, well, social work is a noble profession, so I'll take that as a compliment. So thank you. But you know, it's like. And, and in the public art world, there is a tension that was said really well. Is it, you know, is it art? There's high art, there's this. It's like nonsense. You know, people want art, people should have art, and it's up to mural art, it's up to us to try to improve, be open to critique, to be self-reflective, and to do the best art possible, right? At the end of the day, we could go somewhere, we could go to 13th and Pine and Center City, or 55th and Woodland, and look at a work of art, and we'll have a different opinion about it. Is the community happy? Do they like it? Is this successful? Have things changed? How we determine what success is, it really varies. And art, at the end of the day, is somewhat subjective. So I feel like in one way, I want to hold, hold our ground. We, but, you know, do, we do our work with integrity, hold our heads up. We're going to get picked on. So OK, that's all right. We can take it. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, I get it. And we have a huge responsibility. It is public art. We do want the curric from everything from the curriculum to the community work to the artistic product to be as good as it can be. So we want to, you know, as a program, it's up to us to grow and evolve and change, but also be proud of who we are. Yeah, I think that you know, and we're a smaller program, but we we have. I mean, there is we work with ten children at maximum of 10 or 11 children at, at any given time. And I think that the challenge becomes understanding where they're coming from, um, but really wanting to make them, they must do their best work. They must. They must. And the sad thing that happens after their first show with us, I know what they can do. And therefore, uh, sadly for the kids, they can't get away with anything anymore because, you know, the first time they write, they don't know what they're doing. They, so they just sort of like, okay, I'll do my best job. And then they get the applause and then they get, take a bow. And then they kind of think, all right, well, next time I'm just, you know, I just want the applause and I'm just going to do a pretty good job. But I know and we know and we say, um, I'm sorry, I understand that thing. And I think that the challenge becomes if you're dealing with children who are going through challenges in their life, by virtue of, you know, not, I mean, they have wonderful, wonderful families, but there's not a lot of money at home, and they're facing all these other challenges that, that sort of make me weak in the knees. The, I am not allowed to say that allows, that gives you license to not give me your best. And I think that's the hardest thing. And I think a lot of organizations, particularly that work with youth that come from challenging situations, is there's a mistake that's made the moment that you start to feel sorry for them. And the moment that you start to say, okay, 
because what you're doing is you're treating them differently than you would treat a child that is not coming from their background and therefore you're doing what the rest of the world is doing and you're not having the same expectations for them that you would for any child and so that I think becomes a conflict because there is this part of you that thinks but I want to serve the child and you have I have to realize the way to serve the child is to make help them create really great plays and I think that's what surprises people. These kids write really good plays. Some people sort of go, ooh, you know, plays by kids, I don't want to go. And they come and see and are now our biggest fans. I mean, it's hard to understand, but the kids just write this great stuff. And again, it's because we make them work really hard. It's because when they're phoning it in, we say, and we're never disrespectful, but we'll say, you know, no, I think there's more that you can give me. And they give it, you know, put the bar here, that's where the kids will come to, put it here. Put it here. Keep raising it because that's what they deserve. That's what they right. deserve. I totally agree. You know, it's interesting because um, there's a lot of interest in social welfare now about what people call assets-based approaches, where instead of looking at neighborhoods or individuals as essentially defined by their deficits, that you you look at them in terms of what they what where their strengths are. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that one of the ways that art integrates into community work is the fact that it's hard to do art and just focus on the deficit. You're always sort of focused on, on the assets involved. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point. Um, one other question, then I wanted to throw it up, open. Um, this is the big one, of course. Uh, besides funding, uh, what other barriers do you see that get in the way of being a, of your effectiveness? I mean, I think for us, it's really just preconceived notions about what we are and what we're doing. Um, be, because I, I think that people, the audience that ends up coming to our shows and, we're, and seeing the kids is walks away inspired every time. I mean, it's why we have the best actors in, in Providence. The only reason they ever turned me down when I asked if they want to do a show is because they're busy doing a show that they're getting paid for. But, you know, if they weren't doing that, they will say to me, I, I have actors that call me up and go, okay, Jenny, here's my shows for this season, so tell me when the Manton Avenue Project shows are and I'm going to put it in my calendar now. I mean, I have people booked in nine months in advance for some of the shows because they really want to do it. But I think that our big, my biggest challenge is really, children's theater is really a wonderful thing. We're not children's theater. We are theater by children for everyone. And really, we are. And I think it's people really understanding how much fun they're going to have and really what these kids are capable of. I mean, because, and I think one of the reasons that people have a great time at the shows is because the plays are really, no matter what the theme is, it's about, the plays are really about friendship and love and loss and want and desire and dreams. And all of us can relate to all of those things. And so that's what the plays are about. And I think it's just my biggest, my biggest challenge is getting people in the door and getting people to sort of understand, just understand what we're doing. Maybe it's because they think that helping kids feel empowered and, and, and know that their voices are important is complicated. And so they can't believe that if they come, they'll see the transformation taking place in front of them right there, right there, every time. Uh, but it isn't complicated, and it is that easy, and it does happen every time. And it's really fun. And you, I mean, nobody kind of walks away going, oh, that was just so gruesome and so hard to get through. Thank God they have great candy bars in the lobby. Um, it was really, it's really, it's really, so that's it. I mean, I think getting people to get it is my biggest, and before they see it, once they see it, they get it, and then they tell their friends. It's interesting because you're really talking about the kind of a core issue around the artistic process that wherever the setting is, you're, you're going to see that. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Jim, you? I would say it's very similar. I mean, I think that's why the mural tour program is so important to have people understand the stories behind the work. It's why now we're looking at our work as collections and there's going to be new signage and audio tours and cell phone tours and events in front of the, pro the murals. And then we're going to look at the African American collection and design a curriculum for all fourth graders in the city to look at the history of African Americans in Philadelphia through the lens of murals. I mean, it's important just to get it out there, I think. And then, you know, also I think that it's, I for us it's, you know, I, I'd say that the naysayers, it's that part of it, it's diminished over the years, but when you, you just want people not to prejudge the field of muralism, that it's a glorious history. You know, you think of Diego Rivera and Roscoe and 
Siqueiros and the painters of the WPA and political art in Chicago in the 60s and 70s. I mean, this is really interesting work that Chicano artists in Los Angeles. You know, what we need to do is look at muralism in the 21st century and how are we responsive to that. And we try to build it every way we can. You know, but I, I just feel like once people can just sort of shift their consciousness slightly and be open to the work, the stories behind the work, and understand like the kids and how hard they've worked to create this, and the community members or people in prison serving life sentences, they've created some beautiful murals around the city. It's really phenomenal that then you start to see a shift in consciousness. And, but that's a responsibility we have because it is also a challenge. I mean, we actually at one point did a preliminary analysis of some of uh, uh, the, the mural uh, data to try it. And it was interesting because what came out was that the murals, the impact of the murals was strongest, or we could identify the strongest impact in neighborhoods that also had other things going on, that is other arts programs. So there's a way in which it isn't a silver bullet where you just you know, like put fairy dust and the neighborhood changes. It's, it, it really is this issue of a variety of different elements working together in terms of an ecology. And I think, you know, I think uh, Jane's talent is that her ability to link up, you know, to community groups. And I, you know, I can testify that you go out into the neighborhoods and you talk to the community groups and everyone talks, you know, talks about Jane, you know. So there's that way in which linking it so that it isn't just one code that it is uh, pulling in, into the neighborhood. But you know, you raise this, th these evaluation issues really are, are tough. It's a great question. And I think that um, we, you, know, you look around the country, you learn from success, and you learn from failure. And I think LA, it, 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 I hope there's no one here from LA. I love LA, really, <laughs> in case anyone here's from LA. But there, it was a failure. Because they let the murals get deteriorated and blighted and graffitied. And then, I mean, it, then the, the graffiti abatement teams were painting out murals that were done by the city and no one talked to each other. And that would not happen here in Philly because we have a good relationship with government. But it's really, really our responsibility to deal with that. So we have a mural restoration program. We've been um, getting trained by people at the Getty Museum who preserve the Diego Rivera's and the Sequeiros. And it's complicated made more complicated by the fact that in neighborhoods where the murals are, are sometimes deteriorated, people love the murals that are really not looking good. And so we, it's, we really have to have a, it's, the, it's the same kind of meetings that we have to have about that mural. Like we're going to go in and we're going to either we have to white it out completely because it's beyond repair, or we're going to fix it up, but the, demogra the demographics have shifted and we really need something else. We need to be completely open to that process and understand that it's really complicated, but we're creating works of outdoor art and it comes with a huge responsibility. We're restoring about 40 works of art a year. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I think the reason we have also opened up to mosaic, ceramic, looking at the lots, doing the green wall, temporary art projects is because it's not like our goal is to do 3,000 more murals. It's to do work that is impactful with depth and breadth. That's really what it is about. So that has shifted too. In the beginning, the early years, it was about quantity. Get out there. We've got it. And, and city government was like, Jane Golden, you better work fast or else the budget's going to get cut. And so we did. But, you know, really, that is not what it's about. And it's good that we have come to our senses about, you know, quality versus quantity. But thank you, that was a great question. Thank you. I have two questions, one for Jenny, one for you, Mark. Um, Mark, in culture diversity, and what you show in our own slide, uh, the question becomes, what comes first, you know, the chicken or the egg? Um, I blanked on my question. Uh, oh, chicken and egg. Chicken and egg. Uh, you know, as far as we've gotten on that, is we, we're, we're now able to say, OK, you have the neighborhoods, the art stuff have, the arts assets accumulate and you get these impacts. So we're able to put those temporarily. In terms of what causes certain neighborhoods to have, to engage in art more than other neighborhoods, uh, that for us is still kind of an X factor. Uh, you know, there's something, there's something about neighborhoods that engage in the arts that is different from neighborhoods that aren't. And I mean, it is, there is a policy side to that, because I don't think it's like you can just say, OK, every neighborhood is going to become an arts neighborhood, because you can't in contrast to a health center or a library where you can say, okay, every neighbor is going to have one. 
you can't say you can say every neighborhood has an art center, but you can't say every neighborhood's going to care about the arts to the same amount. So it, it, there is a problem. Well, it's interesting because I think from our standpoint, you have to build on what you can't just go in and say I'm going to start with a tabla rasa and build this stuff. You have to build on what's in the neighborhood. And I think one of the things that both uh, speakers pointed to is the fact that very often there's stuff in the neighborhood that's just not being taken advantage of. You know, there are, there are assets out there that because we don't have the time and the resources to cultivate, we haven't. So I mean, theoretically you could have a point where like you've cultivated all the assets and that's imposing a limit, but we're so far from that that in some ways I, I, I think you're, you're making a good point that you can't just go in the neighborhood and say, okay, we're going to do this all the way. That building on what's in the neighborhood is a much more sensible way to go about bringing about urban transformation, um, you know. And I think, you know, I think there's still a lot of untapped assets in neighborhoods that you could build on. Okay. Um, yeah, I. The parents are some of really our biggest fans and biggest supporters, and at, they don't necessarily know at first. Although we do, while we're in class. Some of the kids will say, Miss Jenny, can I bring my notebook home because I want to ring, read this to my mom or I want to read this to my dad. But really what happens, I think the parents' first understanding of what we're really doing comes when they come and see the show. And I, I think I mentioned, so it's because our shows are free and we, we keep, there is no, I mean, there's a kid with a hat, so it's not really free because there's a kid with a hat at the door who's very tiny and has very very big eyes so yeah try to walk past it but um but but it's really because we want everyone to be able to come to see the shows we never would want to sort of just you know just comp the parents and made them feel self-conscious so nobody gets charged until the big-eyed kid at the end um holds their hat but but you know if just imagine if you are a parent and you're sitting in the audience and you, first of all, get to see your ch you get to see these people that you know are giving 150% of themselves to, to bring your child's work to life. And then you see your child's face. And then after each play, the adults take a bow and they bring the playwright on. And I'm telling you, the decibel level of the applause goes from a very respectable here to a like through the ceiling. And so if you were there and you, all of these people, a lot of them, our audiences are from all across the spectrum, all across the financial spectrum, all across the economic spectrum, are just like whooping and cheering and screaming for your child, your child. You start to understand the power. If you never did know it before, you really get it. You really get what your child is capable of doing with their life. And so that's, I think, how we really, and the parents, I mean, the parents thank us. I mean, I, I have to tell you, I've had parents just grab me and, and hug me, not like grab me and shake me, um, and, and, and thank me. And I'm not really doing anything. I'm, I'm, I'm helping these, we're helping these kids get, you know, get what they've got out. Um, but that's how we impact the parents because then they bring and, and they'll come to every show and then they'll tell their friends. And, and I think what happens is they view, they view the future of their children, hopefully, differently than maybe they viewed it before. So. Well, I think for, for us, I mean, it's very clear that we have deliverables in each area. So for that relate to social services, art education, economic and community development. So in the reentry program, very, very cognizant of statistics. So 13% of people coming in our program are getting rearrested. National average is probably between 50 and 66%. Pretty good. So we're aware of that. Now, what, what is it? What, what are the ingredients? We're working with uh, you know, some professors at Temple to really keep us on track with that. With art education, we've evaluated every year. You know, what, are the, what are we looking for? You know, going, staying in school. We just with some, uh, we had a big grant from Pew last year. We looked at two sites and watched the, and grades. You know, did grade, were grades, did they go up? Um, we um, look at uh, the dropout rate, graduation rate, where the kids go afterwards. Um, then in community mural making, the data we have about economic development and what Mark said is really right. I mean, we no longer, I mean, with the big waiting list, our temptation was always you just go in everywhere. 
So Ms. Jones wants a mural, and maybe there are vacants on the block, and we're going to go in and do a mural and change everything, but that's not really true. So, But if we go in and we partner with the Norris Square Neighborhood Association and the church and the, the group of women who just formed the catering company, and we can go in and create much greater change and then measure it and really look at what are our goals. We are so much more aware of what is it that we want to accomplish with young people, with people in the prison system, and in neighborhoods. And then we... we, we we figure out a strategy to deliver on that. And when we fall short, we analyze why exactly we fell short and what we're going to change the next time around because we understand. And you know what? Funding aside, that's how we should do the work anyway. That's the truth. Because you want to see movement. And you want to be able to do work that shifts, that impacts policymakers and decision makers. Always, when you work on the ground, you always look up at the people who are making the decisions. That's true. Then let's factor funding in the mix. Funders are fickle. Sometimes you're in, sometimes you're out. Sometimes government says yes, no, a foundation loves you. Suddenly they decide they hate murals. OK, fine. You don't like it, somebody else will. But you do, do the work well. And that's part of it. You know, I, re I like how you frame that question, because it's something that we ask ourselves all the time. I'm, I'm actually upbeat these days. You know, uh, uh, Jane and I were both involved. Uh, the new chair of the uh, National Endowment for the Arts was in town in March. And, you know, essentially, well, he, he left uh, town and said, I think I must have seen half of the murals in Philadelphia. He was off by about a thousand, but, but he was really impressed by the murals. And he said, Philadelphia is a city that gets it. And what he, what he was saying was it gets it that the arts affects both the economics of the city and, and, other, and these other dimensions as well. And, it, you know, I was really cheered. He's, he, they've got a program now. They're, they proposed a program called Our Town that's going to focus on using the arts to build kind of this broad, multidimensional, uh, you know, uh, approach to how the arts can, can in, improve neighborhoods. Uh, that the data, uh, when we, we, we did do one study where we looked at uh, school assets as well, but most of these have been just based on nonprofits. Yeah. Well, I think that we should get better at writing about our work. I think getting our work into journals. I, as I said, I think the tours are really important, and that part of our program seems to be growing. It needs to grow even more. And, you know, I think that, you know, how we, you know, mar marketing can be like, oh, marketing, like it's a bad word. But the truth is, it's, it's really, it, you have to tell the story of it. I mean, think about Philly. I mean, we were part of, not alone, but part of a way that we, I mean, we were able to get rid of what was a social epidemic in the city. There was graffiti everywhere, and cities around the world are saying, how in the world did it happen in Philadelphia? So you're right about the return on the investment. You look at our city budget, it's small compared to the, to, you know, what's happening. So people say, oh, you know, government shouldn't support art. Really? They shouldn't? So our kids should be better off going to Greaterford Prison for $45,000 a year? It'd be better to see the city covered with graffiti? Better that the lots that we clean should be dirty again? Like, I don't really get it. So we, what we need to do is talk about it, have write about it, take people out there, and have them really see it firsthand. Like when people come to your place, and they're believers. They're absolute believers. And it's the same thing when people come out. Come to a mural dedication. I mean, Jean, you know this. You mean like come to any one of our events, get out there and see it. Or take, you know, we invite people now out to the prison. And people say, oh my god, this is, this is a deceptively complex program. I, I had no idea that lifers are now, it's a work program, a greater for prison or all the local prisons. So it's like that's, but we have to make it sort of manifest. We have to make it sort of real to people. So it's not just something generic and vague and amorphous, that this is something that's impacting a lot. And I think part of the problem is, is there is some of the impact is not, you can't easily assign a dollar amount immediately to it. You know, so much about exposing kids to art and having kids engage in art and and find themselves in art, even if they don't pursue art as a career, is something incredibly important. And it is creating better citizens. It is creating hardworking people. It is creating a better workforce. But it's really, really hard to show that to people. I mean, there is I mean, there are a lot of arts organizations that, that expose children to, you know, there's a, a program in New York called the National Dance Institute, Institute that was started by a ballet dancer named Jacques Dembois. In their, since 1976, they have worked with 20,000 children. They have impacted 20,000 kids' lives. How is that not incredible? These are kids that never would have been exposed to dance. They teach these kids to dance, but it's like 
the freedom of expression. You know, how can you not say that's an amazing thing? How can you not say that's a, but it's because it's hard to, how do you assign a dollar amount to transforming someone's life? How do you assign a dollar amount to making people think differently about themselves? It's really, really hard. It is going to impact the economy eventually and in a positive kind of a way, but it's really hard. And I think that's why art has a hard time getting, listen, Rhode, I live in Rhode Island. The governor wants to cut all of the state funding for our, our Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. He wants all of Riska's money money to come from the NEA. He doesn't want the state to contribute any of it. So there's this potential for 51% of the arts budget in Rhode Island getting cut. You know, it's interesting. I mean, there's a, the warden at the at Greaterford Prison, it's the sixth largest state prison in the country. He said, you know, they've, they've measured it. They've looked at the incidents of violent outbursts of people who are involved in the mural arts program. And they see it, it's declined, declined, declined to almost zero. So he said, he's a warden. He said, I can spend money on the special, you know, on extra security, or I can let programs come into this prison. That's my choice. And I've chosen a programmatic approach. And I'm like, you know what, he should, t so when he goes to a warden's conference, that's what he talks about. And I'm like, that's fantastic. That's exactly what we need. Well, folks, it's uh, 5 o'clock, so I guess I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming and thank our panel.